Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. <coughs> okay, so we will uh, continue the readings. Um, uh, in relation to the uh, sutta uh, from the Anguttara 8, uh, Anuruddha's exclamations on the seven plus one <laughs> qualities, eight qualities uh, of a great being. And we'll move into the um, quality of contentment. That's the second one that he lists. This dhamma is for one who is content, not for one who is discontent. <clears throat> And basically, um, it was just uh, expanded uh, to describe the, what, what the definition was, is, is essentially being content with the four requisites uh, as the basis for, um, uh, the minimum basis for what we need as practitioners, uh, the four requisites of uh, food, clothing, um, shelter, and medicinal requisites, uh, as we often chant uh, uh, in the morning chanting reflection. So there's lots of readings on this, and we, the four of us met yesterday, and got the next four days of, of readings kind of fleshed out. And I will start with um, some readings actually from the Vinaya, which is a good place to talk here about requisites uh, and contentment with them. Because of, as most people know, and maybe maybe a few of you know, but uh, that um, pretty much all of the um, Paddy Moko rules, the 227 <clears throat> uh, precepts that the uh, the monks follow, um, and the 300 and something that bhikkhunis follow, uh, all come from uh, stories. They, the Buddha didn't just generate these uh, these rules for the sake of having rules. Uh, they came. Uh, one by one, and sometimes through, uh, went through several recensions based on different incidents that would happen with the monks and nuns at that time. And um, so there was always an origin story to each of the, the rules, uh, and some of them were quite entertaining <laughs> uh, as to what uh, monks' intent on the holy life could actually get themselves involved with. Uh, so we'll do a few of those, um, and then some uh, other readings as well. So the first one uh, I thought I'd do would be, um, and, and the origin stories that I'm reading here um, are mostly from uh, Ajahn Jeff's uh, The Buddhist Monastic Code, and they're somewhat abbreviated. I went through the uh, Polytech Society, the original full origin stories, and some of them are just so long that uh, it didn't, it seemed like, well, we'll get the, get the gist of it from, uh, from what Ajahn Jeff has condensed here. <clears throat> and the first one is in regard to uh, dwelling places, uh, and there's uh, several rules that the monks have to follow um, regarding how, how to build dwelling places, how big they can be, some of the standards around them and how they can go about getting materials to, to build the dwelling places. And the, so the first one that I'm going to read uh, is from uh, the set of rules called Sangha Di Sesa offenses. Uh, and this is from Sangha Di Sesa number six, page 142 in uh, the Buddhist Monastic Code, part one. At that time, the bhikkhus of Alawi were having huts built from their own begging, having no sponsors, destined for themselves, not to any standard measurement that did not come to completion. They were continually begging, continually hinting, give a man, give labor, give an ox, give a wagon, give a knife, give an ax, give an adze, give a hoe, give a chisel, give rushes, give bamboo, give reeds, give grass, give clay. People, harassed with the begging, harassed with the hinting, unseen bhikkhus would feel apprehensive, alarmed, would run away, would take another route, face another direction, close the door. 
Even on seeing cows, they would run away, imagining them to be bhikkhus. So you get the idea. <laughs> the Buddha was not pleased. <laughs> and so he instituted this rule that I won't read. Um, we go over these in our Vinaya classes each summer, but uh, uh, setting down some um, strict standards for uh, huts that uh, a bhikkhu can build when they're building it on their own uh, and um, uh, that they can't... Um, uh, exceed certain standards so as to not be burdensome, to keep a simple standard, be content with that. The, um, I will read a little bit from uh, the actual full-on uh, origin story, which is a number of pages, um, a number of pages in the uh, actual origin story, because uh, the, the Buddha goes further to say, Monks, it is difficult for householders to collect possessions and difficult to protect their stores. How can you foolish men dwell intent on begging, intent on asking by hinting for something from among these possessions which are difficult to collect and from among these stores which are difficult to protect, saying, give a man, give a servant, give an ox, give a wagon, give a knife, give a hatchet, give an axe, give a spade, give a chisel, give a creeper, give bamboo, give munja grass, give coarse grass, give tina grass, give clay. This is not, foolish men, for the benefit of unbelievers, and monks, thus this course of training should be set forth. So just to add the Buddha's admonition in his own words. He uses the term foolish men quite a bit <laughs> when he's setting up these rules. So that's uh, some comment on um, being content with our various huts. Then... Um, we can come to robes. Um, there's a, a very famous monk who was the uh, perpetrator of all sorts of things regarding robes. He seemed to have quite this fetish about robes <laughs> um, and wanting very nice ones. And, and he comes up a number of times, and he's uh, the one who generated a number of the rules on, on uh, the very uh, specific ways that we can uh, have robes. Uh, and get robes and what we can specify for them. His name was Venerable Upananda. So I'll read several of them. There's too many of the incidents in different ways that, uh, to read all of them, but I'll read a few of them here about robes. Now at that time, Venerable Upananda the Sakyan was accomplished in giving Dhamma talks. A certain financier's son went to him and, on arrival, bowed down to him and sat to one side. As he was sitting there, Venerable Upananda the Sakyan instructed, urged, roused, and encouraged him with a Dhamma talk. Then the financier's son said to him, Tell me, Venerable Sir, what, what I would be capable of giving you that you need, robe cloth, alms food, lodgings, medicines for the sick? If you want to give me something, friend, then give me one of those cloths that you are wearing. I'm the son of a good family, venerable sir. How can I go about wearing one cloth? Wait till I go home. After going home, I will send you one of these cloths for a more beautiful one, or a more beautiful one. A second and a third time, venerable Upananda said to him, if you want to give me something, friend, then give me one of those cloths, meaning the one that he's wearing. I'm the son of a good family, venerable sir. How can I go about wearing one cloth? Wait till I go home. After going home, I will send you one of these cloths or a more beautiful one. What's with this offer without wanting to give, friend, in that having made the offer, you don't give? <laughs> <laughs> so the financier's son, being pressured by venerable Upananda, left having given him one cloth. People seeing him said to him, Why, master, are you going around wearing only one cloth? He told them what had happened. So the people criticized and complained and spread it about. They're arrogant, these Saki and Sun monks, and malcontent. It's no simple matter to make a reasonable offer to them. How can they, after being made a reasonable offer by the financier's son, take his cloth? So the Buddha set out a rule that uh, um, uh, should a bhikkhu ask for robe cloth from a man or woman household or unrelated to him, except at the proper occasion, it is to be forfeited and confessed. Okay. 
Okay. Next one. Now at that time, a certain householder said to his wife, I will clothe Master Upananda with a robe. A certain bhikkhu on his alms round overheard the man saying this. So he went to Venerable Upananda the Sakyan, and on arrival said to him, You have a lot of merit, friend Upananda. In that place over there, a certain man said to his wife, I will clothe Master Upananda with a robe. He's my supporter, my friend. So Venerable Upananda the Sakyan went to the man and on arrival to him said, My friend, is it true that you want to clothe me with a robe? Now, wasn't I just thinking I will clothe Master Upananda with a robe? Well, if you want to clothe me with a robe, clothe me with a robe like this. What use is it to me to be clothed with a robe I won't use? So the man criticized and complained and spread it about. They're arrogant, these Saki and Sun monks, and malcontent. It's no simple matter to clothe them with a robe. How can this Miss Master Upananda, without having first been invited by me, make a stipulation concerning a robe? So there's a rule set up to not make stipulations with regard to robes, saying to make it just like this. And there's actually another rule that's almost identical with origin story, where he actually goes to the weaver of the robe that was hired and tells the weaver to make it a certain weight and a certain quality and a certain um, um, style that uh, the original donor uh, hadn't specified and, and couldn't afford. <laughs> so the Buddha made another rule saying you can't go and make stipulations to the weaver. Okay. Then Venerable Upananda the Sakyan approached the lay follower, his steward, and on arrival said, My friend, I have need of a robe. Wait for the rest of today, Venerable Sir. Today there is a town meeting, and the town has made an agreement that whoever comes late is fined 50 kahapanas. Friend, give me the robe this very day. Saying this, he grabbed hold of him by the belt. <laughs> So the lay follower, being pressured by Venerable Upananda the Sakyan, purchased a robe for him and came late. The people said to the lay follower, Why, Master, have you come late? You've lost 50. So he told them what had happened. They criticized and complained and spread it about. They're arrogant, these Sakyan son monks, and malcontent. It's no simple matter even to render them a service. How can Upananda the Sakyan, being told by a layman, Wait for the rest of today, Venerable Sir, not wait? Uh, another rule. <laughs> and the last one, there are more, there are several more for Venerable Upananda and robes, but I'll read this last one here. Now at that time, Venerable Upananda the Sakyan had become accomplished at making robes, having made an outer robe of clothes, cloak scraps, having dyed it well and stitched it nicely, he wore it. A certain wanderer, wearing a very expensive cloak, went to him and on arrival said to him, Your outer robe is beautiful, my friend. Give it to me in exchange for this cloak. Do you know what you're doing, my friend? Yes, I know. Okay, then. And he gave him the robe. Then the wanderer went to the wanderer's park wearing the outer robe. The other wanderer said to him, Your outer robe is beautiful, friend. Where did you get it? I got it in exchange for my cloak. But how long will this outer robe, outer robe last you? That cloak of yours was better. So the wanderer thinking, it's true what the wanderer said. How long will this outer robe last me? That cloak of mine was better. He went to Venerable Upananda the Sakyan and on arrival said, here's your outer robe, my friend. Give me back my cloak. But didn't I ask you, do you know what you're doing? I won't give it to you. So the wanderer criticized and complained and spread it about. Even a householder will give to another householder who regrets a trade. How can one who has gone forth not give the same courtesy to one who has gone forth? So that was the origin story of the rule about uh, bhikkhus uh, being prohibited from engaging in various types of trade. So Venerable Upananda is a pretty good example of um, people who are not very content <laughs> with regards to the robes. And then um, 
there's a, let me I'll read this one first, but regarding food, contentment with food, uh, some stories from the suttas. This is not a, a Vinaya story. This is from um, the Majjhima Nikaya, number 66, the simile of the quail. It's a very long sutta um, uh, regarding uh, contentment in various ways. It's a very, it's very good sutta to read uh, on your own. I'm just going to read an excerpt from it. The, um, it's a venerable Udayan um, has come and talked with, and is talking with the Buddha and recalling uh, how the Buddha uh, in successive rulings uh, suggested to the monks, asked the monks to uh, basically just eat during one part of the day, not during uh, all throughout the day, afternoon and evening. And he's recounting his um, uh, history with that. So this is Udayan talking to the Buddha. It has happened, venerable sir, that bhikkhus wandering for alms in the thick darkness of the night have walked into a cesspool, fallen into a sewer, walked into a thorn bush, and walked into a sleeping cow. They have met hoodlums who have already committed a crime and those planning one, and they have been sexually enticed by women. Once, venerable sir, I went wandering for alms in the thick darkness of the night. A woman washing a pot saw me by a flash of lightning and screamed out in terror, Mercy me, a devil has come for me. I told her, Sister, I am no devil. I am a bhikkhu waiting for alms. She replied, Then it's a bhikkhu whose ma's died and whose pa's died. Better, bhikkhu, that you get your belly cut open with a sharp butcher's knife than this prowling for alms for your belly's sake in the thick darkness of the night. And then Udayan says, Venerable Sir, when I recollected that, I thought, how many painful states has the blessed blessed one rid us of? How many pleasant states has the blessed one brought us through the setting down of the rules? How many unwholesome states has the blessed one rid us of? How many wholesome states has the blessed one brought us? And the Buddha replies, "So So too, Udayan, there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this, say, what such a mere trifle, such a little thing as this? This recluse is much too exacting. And they do not abandon that, and they show discourtesy towards me, as well as towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. Suppose Udayana quail were tethered by a rotting creeper and would thereby expect injury, captivity, or death. Now suppose someone said, the rotting creeper by which that quail is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity, or death is for her a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir, for that quail, the rotting creeper by which she is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity, or death, is a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. So too, Udayan, there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this, do not abandon that, and they show discourtesy towards me as well as towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. Udayan, there are certain clansmen here who, when told by me, abandon this, say, what such a mere trifle, such a little thing to be abandoned as this, the blessed one tells us to abandon, the sublime one tells us to relinquish. Yet they do abandon that and do not show discourtesy towards me or towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with mind as aloof as a wild deer. For them, that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. So I thought that was nice words from the, the Buddha saying the advantages of, of, of letting go of that kind of uh, uh, wish for, uh, you know, being able to have exactly what we want, uh, that kind of, showing that kind of contentment that it, um, having abandoned that, those wishes, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts with a mind as aloof as a wild deer. Nice imagery.
Okay, and then the origin story for um, uh, certain tonics that we can keep. Uh, the tonics are a class of consumables like uh, oil, butter, um, ghee, uh, honey, molasses, sugar. Those things that we can keep for up to seven days uh, as an individual monk. Then Venerable Palinda Wacha went to the residence of King Sania Bimbisara of Magadha and on arrival sat down on a seat made ready. Then King Bimbisara went to Venerable Palinda Wacha and on arrival, having bowed down to him, said, sat to one side. As he was sitting there, Venerable Palinda Wacha addressed him. For what reason, great king, has the monastery attendant's family been imprisoned? Venerable sir, the monastery attendant's house was a garland of gold, beautiful, attractive, exquisite. There is no garland of gold like, like it, even in our own harem. So from where did that poor man get it? It must have been taken by theft. Um, the, uh, this isn't the complete story, but the, the actual reason why um, the attendant's house was a garland of gold, and beautiful, was because Venerable Palinda Wacha has great powers and actually turned... Um, the attendant's house into that with all of those requisites and made all sorts of requisites for his daughter and, and uh, of gold that was able to do that. So King Bimbisara uh, thought that the attendant's house must have become that way through theft and he imprisoned, uh, imprisoned the family. Then Venerable Palinda Wacha willed that the palace of King Sania Bimbisara be gold and it became made entirely of gold. But from where did you get so much of this gold, great king? <laughs> Saying, I understand, venerable sir, this is simply the master's psychic power. He had the monastery's attendant's family released. The people saying, a psychic wonder, a superior human feat, they say, was displaced, displayed to the king and his retinue and were, were pleased and delighted. And then they presented venerable Palinda Wacha with the five tonics, ghee, fresh butter, oil, honey, and sugar. Now, ordinarily, Venerable Palinda Wacha was already a receiver of the five tonics, so he distributed his gains among his company, who came to live in abundance. They put away their gains, having filled pots and pitchers. They hung up their gains in windows, having filled water strainers and bags. These kept oozing and seeping, and their dwellings were crawling and creeping with rats. People, engaged in a tour of the dwellings and seeing this, criticized and complained and spread it about. These Sakyan sun monks have inner storerooms like the king. So that was when the Buddha laid down the rule that any of these five con, uh, tonics can only be kept for seven days at a time. Not only for the sake of um, not attracting vermin, but... Um, also, um, yeah, just you can see through all of these stories the, the Buddha's relentless efforts to try and keep requisites to a minimum, keep them simple so that uh, the monks uh, wouldn't be uh, burdened with uh, storing things, wasting things, and uh, could live um, with, you know, with a great, much greater lightness, uh, lightness of being. So a few readings from the Sangyutta Nikaya. Um, uh, there's a, a section in the Sangyutta called the uh, Kasapa uh, Sangyutta, which are connected discourses with Venerable Maha Kasapa, who was renowned for his uh, austerity. And this is um, Sangyutta 16, number one. At Sawati, bhikkhus, this Kasapa is content with any kind of robe, and he speaks in praise of contentment with any kind of robe, and he does not gauge in a wrong search in what is improper for the sake of a robe. If he does not get a robe, he is not agitated, and if he gets one, he uses it without being tied to it, uninfatuated with it, not blindly absorbed in it, seeing the danger of it and understanding the escape. Bhikkhus, this kasapa is content with any kind of alms food, with any kind of lodging, 
with any kind of medicinal requisites. And if he gets them, he uses them without being tied to them, etc. Therefore, bhikkhus, you should train yourselves thus. We will be content with any kind of robe, and we will speak in praise of contentment with any kind of robe. And we will not engage in a wrong search in what is improper for the sake of a robe. If we do not get a robe, we will not be agitated. And if we get one, we will use it without being tied to it, uninfatuated with it, not blindly absorbed in it, seeing the danger in it, understanding the escape. And similarly for the other three requisites. Bhikkhus, I will exhort you by the example of Kasapa, or one who is similar to Kasapa. Being exhorted, you should practice accordingly. <coughs> and Sangyuta 16, number 4, a visitor of families. It's Sawati. Bhikkhus, what do you think? What kind of bhikkhu is worthy to be a visitor of families, and what kind of bhikkhu is not worthy to be a visitor of families? Venerable Sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One. The Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, a bhikkhu might approach families with the thought, may they, give, may they give to me, not hold back. May they give me much, not a little. May they give me fine things, not shabby things. May they give me promptly, not slowly. May they give me considerately, not casually. When a bhikkhu approaches families with such a thought, if they do not give, he thereby becomes hurt. And on that account, he experiences pain and displeasure. If they give little rather than much, if they give shabby things rather than fine things, if they give slowly rather than promptly, if they give casually rather than considerately, he thereby becomes hurt. And on that account, he experiences pain and displeasure. Such a bhikkhu is not worthy to be a visitor of families. Bhikkhus, a bhikkhu might approach families with the thought, when among others' families, how could I possibly think, may they give to me, not hold back? May they give me respectfully, not casually? When a bhikkhu approaches families with such a thought, if they do not give, if they give casually, etc., he does not, on that account, experience pain and displeasure. He does not thereby become hurt. Such a bhikkhu is worthy to be visitor of families. Bhikkhus, Kasapa approaches families with such that thought. Thus, if they do not give, or if they give casually rather than considerately, he does not thereby become hurt. He does not, on that account, experience pain and displeasure. Bhikkhus, I will exhort you by the example of Kasapa, or one who is similar to Kasapa. Being exhorted, you should practice accordingly. And then uh, last from this series, um, on uh, Venerable uh, Maha Kasapa. We mentioned this one in a discussion recently, but uh, here is the whole uh, small short sutta. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Then the Venerable Maha Kasapa approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side. The Blessed One then said to him, You are old now, Kasapa, and those worn-out hempen rag robes must be burdensome for you. Therefore you should wear robes offered by householders, Kasapa, accept meals given on invitation, and dwell close to me. For a long time, venerable sir, I have been a forest dweller and have spoken in praise of forest dwelling. I have been an alms food eater and have spoken in praise of eating alms food. I have been a rag robe wearer and have spoken in praise of wearing rag robes. I have been a triple robe user and have spoken in praise of using the triple robe. I have been of few wishes and have spoken in praise of fewness of wishes. I have been content and have spoken in praise of contentment. I have been secluded and have spoken in praise of solitude. I have been aloof from society and have spoken in praise of aloofness from society. I have been energetic and have spoken in praise of arousing energy. Considering what benefit, Kasapa, have you long, have you long been a forest dweller and spoken in praise of arousing energy? Considering two benefits, venerable sir, for myself, I see a pleasant dwelling in this very life. 
and I have compassion for later generations, thinking, may those of later generations follow my example. For when they hear, the enlightened disciples of the Buddha were for a long time forest dwellers and spoke in praise of forest dwelling, were energetic and spoke in praise of arousing energy. Then they will practice accordingly, and that will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. Considering these two benefits, Venerable Sir, I have long been a forest dweller and have spoken in praise of arousing energy. Good, good, Kasapa. You are practicing for the welfare and happiness of the multitude out of compassion for the world, for the good, welfare, and happiness of devas and humans. Therefore, Kasapa, wear worn-out hempen rag robes, walk for alms, and dwell in the forest. So just a couple of short uh, verses to end uh, these readings for today um, from the Teragata, the verses, um, the, sort of the poetry, uh, the verses of the elders. <clears throat> this one is from the Teragata 157. This was your old hut. I'm sorry, the, uh, the author is the, uh, the bhikkhu Kuti Viharan. Oh, I guess that's, I don't know if that's a name or a Kuti Viharan, dweller in a Kuti. This was your old hut, and you aspire to another, <clears throat> new hut. Discard your hope for a hut, monk. A new hut will be painful all over again. Second one from the Tergata 1.56. <clears throat> Who's in the hut? A monk's in the hut, free from passion with well-centered mind. Know this, my friend, the hut you built wasn't wasted. <clears throat> so the benefits of having a simple hut in the forest. <clears throat> and then this last one um, is a, a verse uh, also uh, from the Teragata 6.6, .6, and it's not particularly related to the, the theme of contentment, but as I was looking through these uh, the Teragata <clears throat> excerpts, uh, this one popped out as one that I thought just in case anybody's having a, any difficulties during the retreat, uh, there's a little bit of inspiring uh, verse here. <clears throat> this is called Sapadasa. Twenty-five years since my going forth, and no peace of awareness, not a finger snap's worth attained. Having gained no oneness of mind, I was racked with lust. Wailing with my arms upheld, I ran amuck from my dwelling. Or... <laughs> <laughs> or shall I take the knife? What's the use of life to me? If I were to renounce the training, what sort of death would I have? So, taking a razor, I sat down on a bed. And there was the razor, placed ready to cut my own vein. When apt attention arose in me, the drawbacks appeared. Disenchantment stood at an even keel. With that, my heart was released. See the Dhamma's true rightness. The three knowledges have been attained. The awakened one's bidding, done. I always thought that's very inspiring to know that 25 years being a monk, not a finger snaps worth of peace, not a moment of, of concentrated mind, no oneness of mind, racked with lust, then with uh, this intense sense of disenchantment, all of a sudden, the 25 years of, uh, of hard work uh, blossomed into full awakening right then and there. <laughs> I didn't know that he 
ran out of his cookie screaming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought there was one where it was 25 years, no peace, and he was going to hang himself, and then with the noose around his neck, he attained our hardship, thinking he's never broken a major precept. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a bit of a conflation of some of them. The, I remember Ajahn Amaro used to tell that as, as, a, as a story, and then I went back and looked, and it was sort of like there were couple of things that I think he had pieced together to come to that one. It was a good one, though. <laughs> Should be one. <laughs> About, yeah, something recollecting on his past virtue or something like that. Yeah, yeah that, this one was a little more dramatic. Running amok from his dwelling, wailing, with arms upheld. Has anyone done that here? <laughs> Run amok from their dwelling with their arms? <laughs> probably. <laughs> I don't know, some of us have probably thought about it. <laughs> I know I've thought about it. <laughs> I have a question. You said the Banaya comes from uh, the stories, and so when do uh, do we know when it was actually uh, written down, or when when the 227 rules were were said as 227 and then passed orally? Yes, I, I think it's a bit unclear as to over the lifetime of the Buddha how they might have been collected and contained. But um, shortly after the Buddha's passing, um, there was a council that came together of uh, the, a lot of the senior attained uh, monks. And then there was recitations of uh, the beginning of recitations of the various teachings and also um, the rules of discipline. Uh, and somewhere in that process, they were you know, somehow organized into the current style that they're presented and preserved in now and then recited orally over time. The first the, the monk who, who recited all of the rules of uh, the Vinaya um, in that council was um, uh, Upali, Venerable Upali, uh, who was quite skilled in knowledge of the Buddhist teachings, uh, specifically regarding the Vinaya. Ananda was very skilled with the uh, sutta, the sutta teachings, and recited the suttas as, you know, and started the organization process how they actually came and over what period of time in the, uh, in the current recension that we have now, word to word. Uh, you know, it's not absolutely clear that I'm aware of uh, uh, you know, exactly how that finally came together, but... Um, but it sounds like the first camp council officially... Was, it was when that was like all started to be pulled together so that there was agreement uh, among uh, those monks uh, surviving. And the Pajamukha was recited um, in the Buddha's lifetime. As, as the rules were being added. Right, but not as the complete, yeah, yeah, not as the complete version, but yeah, as they were going along. Yeah, because the Buddha would have a recitation of the rules just like we do now uh, every fortnight. Uh, we recite all of the rules of the Pajamukha, and they would do that as well. And then, the, and then over time, the rules during the lifetime of the Buddha, like certain questions would come up around a rule or ways that it didn't seem like it was working perfectly well, and then it would be revised. So rules would be revised as time went along during the Buddha's lifetime. And then the nuns have 331, is that correct? Roughly around... 300 and something. 311. 311? And then those extra, about the 90 extra, uh, what is the, the purpose of, of those? Uh... Yeah, some of them are just different. Uh, I mean, and some of them aren't exactly the same, you know, um, differing uh, in some ways, just the differences in, you know, because some of the rules get pretty specific about sexual activity, and we have different anatomies. <laughs> so some of them are specifically oriented towards men versus women that way. And then just some of the cultural um, practices of the time, cultural beliefs of the time, the way that the society worked, uh, the Buddha had a few, uh, a number of, a few different rules that uh, applied to uh, societal standards uh, for, for women at that time that were different from men. So <clears throat> I'm not a very much of an expert in the bhikkhuni patimoka, so I, I couldn't go through all of them uh, very closely, but it ended up being that they had, most of the rules are, are very similar or applicable, and then there were these few exceptions. And additions. Then are they following those same rules at uh, Amaravati, 
or the rules that they follow now are those a little different? Yeah, the the nuns that are at Amravati are um, sila dara. They're not bhikkhunis, mm -hmm. um, so they have kind of a tailor-made, handcrafted vinaya that they follow, based very closely on a combination, say, of, of the bhikkhuni rules and also the bhikkhu rules, mm -hmm. the ones that seem to be more most applicable and most pertinent to present day, you know, experience, especially for people in the West. So it's kind of a, a tailor-made one based on, um, based on a renunciate lifestyle, very similar um, to the, um, uh, uh, the bhikkhu and the bhikkhuni padimokas but also eliminating some of the ones that seem to be a bit more arduous or onerous and, and maybe not quite so applicable in modern day um, Western values. So it was made to make something that was very stringent and very tough like the bhikkhus, but also a bit more re socially relevant uh, uh, for, the, for the nuns at Amravati. So they've adopted that particular ordination and that particular style there. Do, do you know how many rules that they have there about? It, if I remember right, they follow the basic ten precepts um, of, that a, a seminarian novice would, but they've added about, I think it's about 150 uh, training rules, particularly regarding like the, the, the basic ones of not handling money, you know, uh, alms food, use of, you know, how to receive uh, alms food, uh, all the requisites, all the rules around requisites, uh, etiquette, standards of behavior, things like that.